as the Torah says. Lo techayakol neshama. A pasuk in Dvarim. Have you seen it before? Lo techayakol neshama. No one can be left alive. She realizes it. And let's learn about her realizations. Because if the theme is her and saving her, well, to the end of the Torah, we don't get to saving her. Skip to chapter 6. Skip to chapter 6. And let's see two psukim, two verses, that, you know, if you would if pay, copy and paste, you might have inserted it inside our chapter. Here it is. Verse 25, I think, is, is one of them. Okay. Or actually 22 and 23. Look at the language of 22, 23 in chapter 6. <laughs> Hanashim is the language the Tanakh uses in chapter 2. He gives orders to save their lives. Who? Ha'isha v'tkol asher la asher nishbatim la. He gives the order. It could be that this transpires even before the Jewish people surround the city and blow the shofarot once every day, and they surround the city, and seven times on the seventh day, which is Shabbos, according to the Gemara, and then the walls crumble. Did you notice in the continuation of our chapter, what is the address of Mrs. Rachav? It's uh, right into the wall. Right into the wall. Inside. She wouldn't be alive if the walls would crumble. So there are those commentators that want to explain, I saw this by Rav, uh, um, Rav Elchanan Samet, one of the Tanakh teachers of the generation, that he suggests that Yoshua sent a team to save their lives already before the process of surrounding the city, because otherwise we're going to have a hard problem understanding the chapter that the walls fell, people sitting at the wall, at the wall would probably die of the, of, of the crumbling of the cities. Here, Wait. I'm waiting. Um, it's nothing to do with the handing out the Mizonos. So why, well, isn't, if the walls was being, were being collapsed by Hashem, couldn't Hashem just do a little... Yeah, he can do whatever he wants, but we don't rely on miracles. Ain't some chilonanes. Good question. I hope the answer is satisfying intellectually. Okay. What does the team do? We send in a SWAT team, Pasuk of Gemu, I'm reading chapter 6, 23. It's not in the Haftarah. Vayvo ne'arim ameraglim. Now they're called the younger spies. Vayotziu, who do they take out? And notice who's coming out, who's not coming out. Rachav, veta via, veti ma, veta chave, kol ashele, vet kol mishpachot ha'otziu. The entire mishpachologi is taken out, except for husband and kids. Why not? No husband. Wait, she is husband? No husband and no kids. No, of course she's a holiday. It's clear. She has no family. She only has brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, nephews, nieces, and that's it. We have a split story here, if we open up chapter 6. If we're going to say that Rachav is the theme, her turnaround, her saving, being saved, so now we refer to a split story. The meeting with Rachav, men lying down in her house on the roof, being saved by her, and she does 180 degree turn in her life. And now, let's see her godliness, her recognition of God, as she now visits them in the nighttime on the roof when the border police have left the house and she told a fishy story that they left and now they're looking for her. Look, two messages she gives in Pasuk 9 and 10. Vatomer Lanashim. Back in chapter 2, in the middle of the Haftarah. Vatomel and Hashim, she says to the men, the two spies, Yadati, I'm aware, I intimately know, Kinatan Hashem Lachem Aretz. Wow. Number one. Number two, Vechinafla imatchem aleinu, Vechinamogu yoshve Aretz mipnechem. Two facts does Miss Rachav give to the two spies. Number one, the land of Eretz Canaan is a divine land issue to 
Am Yisrael. Number two, the national barometer of the Canaanite peoples, seven Canaanite nations here in Israel, is their hearts are trembling. Notice how she talks in the plural, Aleinu, Shamanu, Vanishma, Vayimas. She's telling us the national psyche of all the people here. Okay? And it's all because she knows, and, and they know as well, but her recognition is greater that God is behind the entire entity of the Jewish people coming into the land of Israel. So here, gentlemen, we could say that Rachav, her rescuing, that could be the theme of this chapter. Uh, even though at the end of this chapter chosen for the Haftarah reading, we don't read about the actual saving, and that's why we refer to chapter 6 in those two verses where the story is completed. And maybe the Tanakh, of course, has its own reasons why it's written there and not here. Okay? But it doesn't seem that the two spies are coming here for a strategic military report. Because uh, Yeshua, by the way, he doesn't know what's going what's to happen. And he doesn't know... It's going to be a miraculous war or war of nature. But let's just say that Yoshua is supposing that he's sending spies because maybe we will have to fight a war through nature, but we don't see any story about military matters. She says the land is yours and the people here are full of fear. Are, are full of fear. So the topic here of this chapter is not the sending of the spies, but it's around the image the personality of Rachav. There was a great rabbi, the brother-in-law of my uh, Rosh Hashiva, Rabbi Avram Remer, a great educator, in blessed memory. He taught in the Rav Kook Yeshiva High School for many years. He was a, a builder of Beit El. And he explains that this meeting, to go into Eretz Yisrael, is a meeting of spirituality, of, of uh, purity, regarding the laws of modesty. In the place of Shittim, the daughters of Moab prostituted. And the men of Israel fell. How many men fell in that plague? Do you remember? We're going to read it in a few weeks. 24,000 people, if I'm not mistaken. Right? 24,000 people fall in a plague. When the door... Yes, interesting number. And that's when Kozbi, Batsur, one of the daughters of royalty from Midian, is there as well. For the Jewish people to conquer the land of Israel, we have to overcome the laws of promiscuity. We have to overcome the laws of proper modesty. And in order to get into Israel, you have to leave from the place where we stumbled. We fell and sinned in Shittim, as we're going to read in a few weeks from now here in the book of Bamidbar, which will be in the 39th, 40th year. It doesn't happen now. Therefore, to succeed in conquering the land, we have to purify ourselves from the laws of immodesty. And therefore, it's not by mere incidence, but rather there is a reason, an objective, that Aleph, we're leaving from the place where we sinned, and Bet, they wind up in the house of Rachav, the woman that represents all the loose laws of modesty in Canaanite culture. And here, not only do the two spies not fall, not stumble, Mrs. Rachav represents the world. She represents not only the Canaanites, represents the world. The entrance of the Jewish people to the land of Israel is not only a national matter, it's also a universal matter. This lady turns around, she turns her life around, she has a clear recognition of the God of Israel. And she recognized that the land was given by God to the Jewish people. And she's heard about in the last 40 years all these great miracles, how God has revealed himself to the Jewish people, splitting the sea, taking them out of Mitzrayim beforehand, winning a major war against two powerhouses, Sihon the king of Amoria and Og Melech Abashan, as she states here in verse 10. And therefore... 
This woman is representing the world. When the Jewish people come into the land of Israel, it's going to have an effect on the world. She does giyur afterwards, and she becomes the first lady. She becomes married to Yoshua ben Nun, as stated by Chazal. Stated by Chazal. So we see that this idea of, of meeting in her house, God, I don't know if it was meant to be, directed a strategy, or it happened, this is what happened, but this becomes the major theme here, that we now finding a new spiritual level, a new moral level. The Jewish people, represented by two people, are now, and you know that you know their names, right? One is Kalev, and the other is Pinchas. These two enter, meet up with her, and her life is saved to represent that the Goyim, righteous Goyim, have a part in the development of the Jewish people. We need a woman that saw every terrible thing in the laws of immodesty. She was in the butts, she was in the mud of all this life, and now she's a tremendous balat shuva, and therefore the story is told here about her. Her life is saved afterwards, and not only that, but let's read again the last pasuk. I actually read in verse 11. Vanishma vayimas levaveinu. She's speaking in the plural language. She's representing the Canaanites that want to do tshuva. We heard all the divine events. Our hearts, all of our hearts were, we, were melted. There's no spiritual force. There is no deity, there's no idolatry that can meet up against the God of Israel. No ruach can stand up against you. And now look what she admits to, reading the middle of verse 11. Ki Hashem Elokechem, Hu Elohim, Bashamayim Mimal, Ve'la'aretz Mitachat. The God of Israel is not a heavenly God. The God of Israel is not something a power that just created the world and now everything is on automatic pilot, but he's the God here, Allah Aretz. God is involved. There is divine management. There is reward and punishment. There is godly involvement. There is prophecy in the world. And therefore, from this verse, she decides to use a very similar language, maybe not knowing, but Moshe Rabbeinu in Devarim chapter 4 makes a very similar acknowledgement. Okay? The same words which were inserted and become the ending prayer. Shacharit, Mincha, and Arvit. The prayer enacted by Yeshua called Aleinu Lishabeach. That paragraph, the end of paragraph 1 is basically a, a if not a direct quote, but paraphrase of these words. So gentlemen, it's becoming more clear that the theme of this chapter is that when the Jewish people come into the land of Israel, it's not only a national event, but it has universal ramifications, ramifications and importance. We're talking about a God of the world. He's the God of the Shemayim, and he's the God of the Aretz. He's even the God of the Chinese people. He's the God of everyone. In other words, when the Jewish people come into the land of Israel, it's going to affect the world. It's the heart. Okay? okay? This is in opposition to nationalism of every nation on the map of the world. The Scandinavians, the Germans, the Italians, the Brazilians, everyone else. Their nationalism, whatever it is, it's limited to them. They're not here to bring the universe, planet of earth, mankind forward in any moral or spiritual way. As Rav Cook writes, we see often the national tendencies of nations, how it leads to, to troubles, how it leads to, to terror, how it leads to murder and so on and so forth. Our nationalism leads to promoting peace to the world. Our nationalism leads to promoting, spreading God to the world. So therefore, we're now learning about the future 
capturing of Yericho. Why do you think that they're sent specifically to Yericho? What is Yericho called? Is it just because of proximity? We're on the other side of the river, the Moabite plain area, and Jericho happens to be the first city we're coming into? Or there's more than that. Yericho is called the man'ul, the key, the lock, I'm sorry, of Eretz Yisrael. Okay? This lock or key is going to be a very, very important forward for the capturing the last of Israel. Yes, if we win over Yericho and they're a very big powerhouse and they have a king, they have a culture, this will provide a lot of demoralization perhaps. It will demoralize the people that if Yericho is conquered and won over, then it can have a lot of importance for the rest of the war. What did you want to add? Uh, is Yericho from the word uh, Ruach? Yareach, the moon. When you look, when you look in the Jericho Valley, I was on guard duty last night when you guys were having a lovely barbecue, okay? And I was, that's why I couldn't attend. And I was looking east at the Moabite Mountains, and I saw the lights of Amman Jordan as a clear night from where I am, very pretty view, and. I was saying to myself, I'm looking at the lower Binyamin Hills of the eastern side of Benjamin. And I said to myself, Menachem, do you know what's under those hills? The city of Jericho, we're going to be learning tomorrow. And I asked myself, why can't I see the city of Jericho? That's because the hills are covering, because the city of Jericho is flat in the bottom of the valley, probably minus as far as altitude is concerned. Is but there? of course, it's one of the hottest places in the country. It's one of the hottest places in the world. The dead, you know, just a little further south, the Dead Sea is it's one of the hottest places place on, or, or almost hot. We'll have a competition right after this, sure. Well, I don't know. It, it's very hot. You're right. But I'll let you open up the weather report after sure and compare the degrees of Celsius, which is hottest. A lot is going to win the is going to win the race. <laughs> okay. Until now, we're going back to here, my dear friends. Um, what I wanted to say about Jericho, when you see the moon, it like lightens up the entire valley of Jericho. Yoshua ben Nun, his light is compared to the light of, Jer of the Yarech, the moon. As opposed to the light of Moshe Rabbeinu, the Midrash says, is compared to the light of the sun. Shemesh and Yoreach. Yoshua, the, the moon is a reflection, is it not, of the light of the sun. So Yoreach, Yericho, Yoshua ben Nun is all related to that. Yoshua was the disciple of Moshe Rabbeinu. His light comes from the light of Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu did, he did smicha, remember? Besamachet yadav. He put his hands on Yoshua. He like, gave power, prophetic powers and greatness to him. So Yoshua is a reflection of Moshe. Yareach, the moon, is a reflection of the light of the Shemesh. It has to do with this madness matter. My dear friends, we're learning about our great mistake in the sending of 12 spies. Why does Yoshua send spies? Why? Didn't he learn from them? Didn't he know there was a great mistake making, made? Why send spies? Question one. And if you are going to send spies, did he learn from the mistake? Moshe Rabbeinu in the 40th year, in a war going to Yazer and Yogbaha, as we learn in the Chumash, in the Chumash Bamidbar, repeating for him, send spies as well. Moshe also learned from the mistake. Yoshua learned from this mistake, and therefore, two, quiet. Name's not mentioned, no bandwagon, no way, uh, hoopoo, parade, and go, dan, 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 charge, and they're going in, and this and that. No, none of that. So apparently, he learned from the mistakes that were made. Moshe sends to spy Yazer. Later on, in the Sefer Yoshua, you're learning when there's a war to go up against Ta'ai, Yoshua also sends spies. When B'nai Dan want to uh, capture areas, by the Hermon, a place called Laish. They also send spies. Sefer Shoftim, when B'nai Yosef 
one, two, spy out Beitel. They also send spies. So, what's that? That's the best thing, to be quiet. It seems that way. My dear friends, eh, this woman, she's basically endangering her life, isn't she? If she's hiding, two spies of the Jewish people, she's hiding, she's basically endangering her entire life. And we have to make clear to ourselves that she's so smart and so clever that she is able to hide them in a way where no one would able to find them under all this flax, all this vegetation. And here you see how deeply connected she is to the future of the Jewish people. She is sharing the experience of what's going on here in the entire country. All of the Canaanites are terrified, terrified of the Jewish people. Okay? And why are they terrified? Because of God. Is it clear to you? In Pasuk Yud, in verse 10, you have to deeply understand it. Why are the inhabitants of the land of Canaan terrified? She says, Ki shamanu et vish Hashem. And she mentions God's name, Hashem Elokechem, Hashem Elokim Bashamay Mimal. Rachav is well, she's a clear orator. Her orating ta skills are so high. It's not because the Jewish people are strong themselves. It's because of the terrific power of God and God revealing himself to them. So here she recognized the God of Israel, but she recognized the God of Israel is a good God because he's the God of the world. That's what she says here in verse 11. Do you notice it? And therefore, eh, all the geopolitical events that are happening now is because of the God of Israel. Now, some woman to stand up and say such ideal words, such a noble idea, if she cannot be a simple woman, okay? Because until now, we know what her personality is and what her life is, the total opposite. She sells her body. She cares less for godly matters. And now we're revealing such a deep understanding that now she's revealing and you should know that there's a row of Midrashim that Rachav is up there equal to superstars that were part of the Gentile nations. She's like up there equal to a Yitro that, that, that did Gior. She's equal to a person like Naaman, the minister of war from the, 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 the Syrian army. In other words... There are two great personalities in the Tanakh, like Naaman, Sarts of uh, Damasic, and Yitro, who becomes the father-in-law of Moshe Rabbeinu, that they recognize God as a universal God. They're the first ones to recognize God. And here it is, Misrachav, she too, saves these two spies, and her answer, her response, is so noble, is so great. She knows that these two people represent God. And therefore, she's willing, therefore, to endanger her life. Because if she's caught by the border police, what's going to happen to her? Finito. Okay? And uh, the, I want to ask you, why does she not realize or re resolve her matter just for her to be saved? Okay? Why is she asking to be saved? Why is it clear that she needs to be saved? <laughs> because what does she know? That Israel is going to annihilate, destroy the entire city. So notice what she says in Pasuk Yedalid, in verse 14. Vayomru laha anashim. After the P, after she asks for them to swear. She doesn't trust them. Look at this in Pasuk 12. Let's read verse 12. Ve'ata enel, hi shavu nali, ba'ashem, yudke vavke. As if she learned the laws of swearing. She knows, I, don't be a joker. Don't be a fool. I want you to swear in your God's name. Swear to me in his name. Ki asiti machem chesed. Realize I'm saving your life. I'm doing chesed. Vasitim gamatem in beit avi chesed. I want you to do 
chesed with my father's house. It's interesting. She's related to her roots now. She cares for her parents. She cares, for, excuse me, for her relatives. She knows that the city is going to be flattened, erased. And therefore, she doesn't just want to be saved herself. She wants to have chesed with her father's house. I want to give you, I want you to give me a true sign as well. Okay? What is, does she ask for a persecuted gimel? Vachayitem, I want you to cause to save the life of Aviv Yetimi, my father and my mom. Vetachay vetachiotam, my, my brothers and sisters. Vetkol Asha, wherever their relatives are. Vitzaltem enafshotenu mimavet. Oh, here is the key word, mimavet. She knows that Israel is about to kill everyone in the city. And therefore she's asking, save my family. Okay? Right now, she's maybe she's believing that there's hope, that her family can do tshuva. Now, my question to some of you is the following. You're sent on a mission. Do you have authority or are you just a messenger? When you're sent on a, message, a, a mission to be a messenger, do you have authority to make decisions on behalf of those sending you? This is a major question. And it's clear in military matters and social matters and parental matters because she's asking for their word. Does, do these two, can they go on the uh, shortwave radio and, and get a quick answer? Obviously not. Right? They can't get Morse code. Is that what it's called in English? Morse code. There's no, no Morse code here. We're going to prove that the shlichut that these two were given by Yoshua ben Nun, the leader of Israel, is not a shlichut without samchut, without authority, but rather it is a shlichut with samchut. How can we prove that they were given authority? Look at the next pasuk. Pasuk Yudalad, they make a decision. Vayomru l'anashim, nafshenu tachtechem lamot. Im lo tagidu et Look. If we don't do what you're asking us to do, then we deserve death. But there are certain conditions. You have to be quiet. Don't spill the beans. Don't publicize this agreement. The agreement has to be secret. And it'll be. When there are certain. When God's going to give us, deliver the land. So here you clearly see that they receive shlichut, apparently, as Rav Elchanan Samet explains in one of his articles, that they were given the shlichut, but with samchut. They have authority to make a decision on behalf of Am Yisrael. We're going to save your life. We're going to save your family's life. And they enter into this agreement by taking an oath. Pasuk Tedvav, although the oath is not stated here, maybe for shortened language. Vatoridem b'chevo barachalon. She lowers them. It's the middle of the night. She uses a rope outside the window. Her, her house borders the, the wall. She gives them instructions. She's sharp. To the mountain go. Meaning which direction? West. West. The Judean desert mountains are west. The east is totally flat. That's the valley going towards the Jordan River. Why? There are pursuers. And they're going to pursue you to the east. A great idea. Hide for three days. Here you see the oath. And now what do they suggest? Give a sign. Our SWAT team has to know exactly where you're alive, where you're living. At tikvat chutashini, tikvat here does not mean tikva, but it means a kav, a chut. Ken in pasuk yudchet. Ken it's a chevel. Rashi says lashon kav a chevel. Here is this scarlet chut, this rope. Tikshuri b'chalon. I want you to tie it to the window. No, that'll be a sign. So there are several signs here. What will 
the SWAT team of Yoshua ben Nun look for? Number one, if you keep on reading the Psukim, uh, let's read 19. Condition number two, Vaya. Kol asho yitzei Anyone that leaves the house, his blood is on his head, meaning he's going to be shot, he's going to be killed. Everyone must remain inside the home when we attack. Okay? We'll be clean or absolved of this Shavuah. We'll be responsible for everyone inside your house. If, God forbid, their blood is spilled, we're going to take responsibility. Don't tell anyone. It has to be a secret. Summary. Three conditions are made between the two spies and the, the woman, Rechav. Number one, tie a rope, as a, a scarlet rope, as a siman that we know where you are. Number two, at the time of war, everyone has to be collected inside the house and don't allow them to go out. Number three, don't spill the secret to anyone. Does Rachav receive or accept these three conditions after she's causing them to swear? Look how diligent, look how quick she is. In Pasuk Kaf Aleph, Vatomer she says and agrees, Kedivrechem Kenu. Okay, I agree. Follow the wording in Hebrew. Vatishalachem Vayelechu, they're sent and they go. And what does she do right away? She ties that rope immediately. She doesn't wait to the day of the war happening. She's smart. She's diligent. She is with full of alacrity. And she's keeping it. So Rachav, yes, accepts the conditions. She ties what she's doing. And now the spies leave exactly according to the strategic orders of Rachav. Go west. Hide out there three days. They're obviously not going to find you in the west. They're going to look for you in the east. There'll be some sort of uh, a time of uh, laxness as, as far as the army is concerned, probably. Uh, uh, there's going to be some weak times. And you're going to be able to go back. What happens? Gentlemen, they do exactly like they were told by Miss Rachav, Pasuk Kaf Gimel. Vayashuvu shnei anashim. Their names are not even mentioned again to show how successfully they are working clandestinely. They climb down the mountain going west to the east. And they're passing. Passing what? The Tanakh has no need even to say what are they passing? The Yardain, very good. They're passing the Jordan. They don't talk to anyone else. They go straight. And that's why the Tanakh doesn't mention it. That's exactly what uh, Thomas is saying. The, the Tanakh doesn't even bother saying Vayavro, but if you still want to know what it is, Rashi says, like you said, Etayardain. And the Tanakh is speaking shortly here. Gentlemen, they come to Yoshua ben no, no one else. They don't go to anyone else. And let's see the report they give. Notice what they say and what they don't say. How concise they are and to the point. It seems they're giving... No military message, which can prove a point that they're sent to check out what is the spiritual situation of the Canaanites. What do they feel? We're not looking now for a strategic way to fight against Jericho. It seems to be a, a spiritual moral test for the two spies. Are we, have we overcome our, our laxness in immorality matters? Look what they say. Vayamru Yoshua. Number one, Kinatan Hashem Biadenu et Kol Haaretz. Exactly what she said, almost verbatim. The entire land is ours, is ours, given by God. Number two, Vigam Namogu, Kol Yoshvei Haaretz Mipanenu. Wow. So you see, the two clear messages. No military message. Okay. Uh, the, the, everything is concise. Everything is almost verbatim. Exactly what Rachav said in Guf Rishon. Now Yoshua is being told. And Yoshua asks no questions. The, cha the chapter 
ends like this, totally with no other things here. So you have something here very, very special, gentlemen. No reaction by Yoshua. When the war does happen, okay, and Yoshua eh, fulfills the Shavua, the oath in God's name to save Rachav and save her house, that becomes the end of the story. But when we read the end of the Haftarah here, we don't have the end of the story. And that's like it's a split situation. Only uh, do we see later in the chapters the initiative by Yoshua, and in chapter 6, the fulfillment and the saving of Rachav and her family. So it seems that this, in, and I told you Rav Samet, one of the Tanakh teachers, he holds that the saving of Rachav and her family precedes the falling of the walls, because otherwise it would really be a difficult situation. So what we can see is, there's a tremendous, if we can summarize and say, there's a tremendous lesson that's learned from the mistake of Moshe Rabbeinu's time, the sin of the spies. Two people are sent quietly, only two, and not others. Their names are not uh, mentioned. There's no bandwagon. They go into, unseen, to the city of Yericho. They find shelter, and through the hashkacha, God's divine supervision, they find exactly what will make them a success. Someone is now betraying the Jericho, the Canaanite people, and it's a woman who is so immoral that she is now uplifted. I want to say a very famous midrash that shows a correlation between Rachav and the Jewish people. Do you know when Rachav became so proficient so wondrous in her terrible activities of being such a prostitute when there was a fall of the Jewish people. Cheta Egel, the Midrash says, when we had the sin of the spies, then this woman, who apparently has so many great capabilities, she poured oral, oral her talents into the lack of decency with such sexual immorality. That's what she did. And now, the Jewish people in the 39th year, when we fall and we have the terrible plague of 24,000 dying, Things are still full of havoc and sexual immorality in, in Jericho. And now the Jewish people are cleaning up. That generation is no longer alive. The Jewish people are ready to go in. Moshe Rabbeinu has passed away. The 30 days, according to Chazal, have not even been completed in mourning. Three days prior to that, do we send in quietly the two spies? No one else knows about it. They're tzaddikim. Kalev and Pinchas, Pinchas especially, we can pinpoint him. He's the one that stood up against his promiscuity. He was the one that stood up and killed uh, Kozbi and Zimri ben Salu. He's the one that had the zealousy, the love of God, the caring of God, the, 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 the great respect of God that he doesn't even ask questions and he just kills them. And he's wiping out sexual sin. And he's the one sent in. He's the same one that later is going to be try to make peace. He's going to be like the coin Gadol, and he's successful. So here we see now that a very important task has finished, has been completed, and this is a prerequisite for the Jewish people as a whole to go in. These two people represent the, re, the correction of, of sin, of sexual immorality. Right now, they go and meet up with number one, Terrible immodesty, no fall, no decline. They're not only no fall, no decline, but they're uplifted. They're saved by this woman. And then she makes this wonderful declaration of faith. And she tells the situation that I see God. And the, and the Canaanites are beginning to see God. They're not coming to do Gior. They're not coming to join. But they're totally terrified. And this is an accumulation of events of 40 years. Number one, she mentions the Yitziat Mitzrayim, the exodus of Egypt. Number two, she mentions the, 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 the tearing, uh, the splitting of the sea. And now she mentions a current event. Two powerhouses, armies strong, led by two kings, Canaanite kings, Sichon and Og. They and their armies are not only defeated, they're wiped out. The Rambam writes, in Ishmona, I think it's in Ishmona Prakim of the Rambam, 
uh, when he talks about freedom of choice. And the Rambam, of course, explains that one of the fundamentals of, of, of our hashkafat olam, of our belief in God, is that God, although has everything, he knows everything in advance, yet we always have freedom of choice to decide what to do or what not to do. And then he mentions only a few cases where freedom of choice was taken away, and it's because of a divine purpose, obviously. Hikshayt libo shel paro, God hardened the heart of paro. As Ramban explains it, after plague number five, when Paro still had a chance to do repentance, from there on, God took away his freedom of choice. And it's for a purpose that he and the Egyptian nation see the power of God, the providence of God, the, the management of God in his world. That's case number one. Case number two, he mentions, as we see in the repetition of these two wars in the book of Devarim, so too did God take freedom of choice away from Og and Sichon and he stirred them to, to, to attack the Jewish people to purposely attack the Jewish people so that we can clobber them thereafter it doesn't state it's, it, it states it that as well in the book of Zvarim <clears throat> and therefore there are times that God takes away freedom of choice but here this woman she's making her choice she makes her choice based upon this you can imagine what uh, Yoshua is going through to put, to put his feet into the boots of a Moshe Rabbeinu, to walk in the position of the substitute of Moshe Rabbeinu is like impossible. And you can imagine maybe the, the, uh, <clears throat> the anxiety that he has, the fear that he has. Will the nation support him? Will they not? But now, when Yoshua gets this information, the next morning, okay, he doesn't say anything, just gets, gets up early. And they start traveling from Shittim. They go to the Jordan. And there, they're going to lodge over there. Three days, he sends out the police officers, the next chapter, to not to admonish, but to get the nation ready. We are going to be moving in. In other words, it seems that Yeshua gets a boost. He gets uplifted. His confidence is even built more. He sees a sign, a clear sign of God, that God is with him. And that's really our ability to conquer the land of Israel. We can never, oh, we can never say, Kohi ve'otzem yadi asali It can't, it's not our force. We have force. We have power. We have to train. We have to know that God is behind us. We have to know that God is behind us. And that we see today. Today in the fantastic army of the IDF, we see the training of the top soldiers and the best officers and the hardest training. And we have to know, though, that Hashem is giving us this, these abilities to do beyond nature. We can't afford not to be beyond nature. We're, we're, we're not under the laws of nature. We're not a normative nation. We're a divine nation. We belong to the divine entity. And therefore, the talents and the things that we're able to do are geared from Hashem. May we also, in our study of Torah and working on our our midot and your achamayim and our love of Torah and our contribution to the Jewish people realize that there are tremendous talents that we have. And what we have to do is tap onto them, relate to them and connect to them. And with tefillah and going forward, we're going to see how Hashem is going to be progressing our lives. Amen. Baruch, Tiyah.